If you like the video, then please consider supporting Slopes Game Room on Patreon. Let's go back to the 90s people, and no, not the vibrant Saturday morning Nickelodeon Bart Simpson-esque version that we all never shut up about. I'm talking about the gritty horror-filled 90s. So, what have we got here? There's the obvious Clock Tower games, there's the previously mentioned Splatterhouse games, Alien Trilogy, Nightmare Creatures, no not that one, Doom, Alone in the Dark, Seven Guests, Night Trap, Ill Bleed, Resident Evil, as previously mentioned again, Tomb Raider. <laughs> yes, I know they're not all horror games per se, but I can guarantee that they did indeed make plenty of my watchers poop their pantaloons as youngsters when experiencing them for the very first time. Oh yes, scary sections in video games were not always intended from the get-go and most definitely not expected from the pocket money saving teenagers who bought them. And to be fair, that's exactly what made them scary. And for me, during about year 8, which makes me about 12 or 13, for those that are not part of the UK schooling system, I very naughtily became obsessed with horror movies too. Which in turn led me down the route of even more proper horror themed video games. Yep, when I wasn't playing games on my Mega Drive, Mega CD, PlayStation or Super Powered Gateway 2000 PC, I was skimming the Sky TV listings, finding whatever classic horror I could find, and recording over old episodes of Thunderbird so I could watch classics like Troll 2. They're eating her! And then they're going to eat me! Like I said, this led me down the path of horror video games, and even though I still feel like I made the right choice jumping from Sega to Sony, I can't deny that I was very, very envious of people that got to play this. <laughs> and with that, I think it's about time that I say, join me for this year's late Halloween special as we take a look at the long requested history of the House of the Dead franchise. Well, we'll be looking at the game's development, the movies, the incredibly obscure spin-offs, and of course, the games. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. As a kid, even though, like I said, I was envious of Saturn owners for games like this and plenty of others, I would never admit it to myself and because of this my first experience was actually found on the very next generation, the Dreamcast on my imported House of the Dead 2 game with the gun of course. Well hold up, hold up, like I said guys, this is House of the Dead 2. Two. And because of that, I think we are in fact getting a little ahead of ourselves. So, let's go back to the beginning. This guy is Takesha Oda, and after joining Sega's AM1 division around about 1994, his first project was the relatively unknown puzzle and action treasure hunt in the arcades. For those that don't know, it was the third game in the Treasure Hunt series, and yeah, it's actually pretty good. I'm likely to cover this series myself in the future, as it actually has roots with another classic Sega series that I love, called The Bonanza Brothers. Anyway, after that game got released, and whilst it was getting exclusively ported to Japanese Sega Saturns, Oda-san and his team decided that they wanted to create a light gun game next. Several ideas on exactly what theme they should go for started to float about among the team, and originally a police themed game, which let's be honest was probably the very first thing you'd think of, was put forward. But the big problem with doing this was the fact that the Sega R&D AM2 team had already put out the incredible Virtua Cop. 
And come on, nobody wants to go up against Yu Suzuki, right? Well, from what I've read in several interviews, friendly internal competitions amongst other development crews are actually quite common. I mean, it makes sense. Competition always ends up pushing out the very best content, and this was no different. If his team really did want to go up against who was essentially Sega's Miyamoto, then he would have to do something far more radical than Virtua Cop. So with that, it was back to the drawing board for AM1, which was when they decided to go for a slightly older demographic. The crew quickly worked out that zombies, although Oda Sun never actually liked to call them that, well, that's a fairly untapped market, so let's go ahead and do it. <laughs> if only that was the case now. Anyway, like I said, it was as simple as that, guys. A product made from some friendly in-house competition and, of course, eliminating what had already been done to this standard before. Sega R&D AM2 can appeal to the casual gamer, and this evil dead creature-looking series was going to be aimed at the adult hardcore audience. However, it is important to note that although internal competitions were a constant, almost encouraging thing within the walls of Sega Japan, it was all friendly competition as this eventual Night of the Living Dead shooter did in fact use the Virtua Cop engine. But taking a light gun engine designed around cops and robbers did in fact bring its own set of challenges when turning it into a zombie shooter. You see, the upcoming horror game would eventually come out only two years after the release of the awesome Virtua Cop game, and a year after that game's sequel. Oda Sun and his team knew that they had to step up the production values as well as try plenty of new stuff if they was gonna stand out, most of which may seem normal by today's standards, but very much for its time, this was a first of its kind, not only for Sega, but for the whole of the arcade gaming scene. The biggest change was going to be the way the game was played. If you've never played Virtua Cop yourself, you will be surprised as to how different it is compared to the more well-known franchises, say like Time Crisis. Instead of just having the odd bad guy pop up in a scene ready for you to shoot at, in this series, the camera actually sort of locks onto the rough area that the bad guy or civilian will be in, resulting in each shot sort of becoming a lot more about perfect timing and accuracy rather than guns blazing finger trigger action. It works because you're supposed to be a professional, and for the longest time, this was what the average gamer was used to. A zombie light gun game though, well, not really the same thing is it? These bad guys need to take multiple hits, and because of this they needed to feature a lot of animations compared to the obvious just jump up and fall down. On top of this, as you pummel bullets through the bad guys, they obviously get a lot closer to you, and therefore the targets were obviously going to be getting a lot bigger, making this whole process incredibly hard for the team to not make too easy. On paper, the idea was great, but in reality when creating a simple Virtua Cop zombie mode mod, it just wasn't going to work. The whole thing became incredibly hard to fix. Playtesters didn't really understand what they was doing either, and the team quickly realized that including transitions between as many of the creatures as possible will be the perfect way to show the player that they have finally killed the bad guys. Obviously, by doing this, not only did they fix the very biggest issue to House of the Dead, but unknowingly, they actually made the game seem a lot more terrifying and frantic, which is exactly what you would be like if you was running through what is essentially a haunted house. The vast majority of the dead and nights found in the game were actually motion captured, using real actors doing over the top exaggerated performances, however, this made them still look way too lifelike, and the team had to manually distort their movements taken from the actors to make them seem, um, even more dead like. The end result obviously worked. House of the Dead was not only a big seller in the arcades with its 50 inch or 29 inch monitor versions, and although I don't have much feedback from its release in Japan, 
In America, and eventually Europe, the feedback from arcade goers was great, even if most people saw the game as, well, as a bit of a comedy zombie fest, which was most definitely not the aim of those original developers. Whatever the case, it sold well. People flocked around to see the grotesque action and desperately waited in line for their chance to play House of the Dead. And because of this, it obviously didn't take long for Sega to port this bad boy to the Sega Saturn. This version was released one year after the Japanese arcade release in 1997, and for the most part, it's actually pretty damn good. Now sadly, it's obviously not as good graphically, and you do get pulled out of the action when suddenly everything stops for a quick loading screen in between all of the frantic action. But come on, 1997, that was to be expected. Plus, some would argue, and I'm sort of with them, that those extra jaggedy edges and jolty movements actually add to the dirty mid-90s feel probably more than any other version going. Does it make it scarier though? Well, that's very much your opinion, isn't it? If you get a chance to play the arcade version, obviously that's the best version, but the Sega Saturn port is actually not that bad, all things considered, and I'll tell you now. That's going to be a very obvious theme for this video. In almost every single instance, the arcade releases will always be better than the home ports. Right, so, House of the Dead. As you can see, the constant action and obvious horror settings really did help it stand out amongst the competition. Unless you know the game inside out, just seeing that first person view constantly look in any direction really did keep you on your toes and almost gave the game a bit of a first person shooter feel compared to what people were used to beforehand. And although most westerners did find the game a little bit comical as previously stated, that was never the intention. In fact, in an interview with the website of the dead, Takeshi Oda actually recalls taking inspiration from the movie 7. Not in its characters or action found in the game, but instead the atmosphere portrayed in that movie. On top of this, an incredible talk by Sean Smith gave some pretty in-depth details on how every major boss, not just in the first game, but every game leading up to the Wii version, actually have taken inspiration from most of the major tarot cards. <laughs> how crazy is that? So yeah, not much else really needs to be said here. The game is a great first entry, seriously hard to play, especially at home, where you can't just keep pummeling in money. It goes for a silly amount of moolah now, unless you import it from Japan, which you definitely should do because it's 100% in English. And obviously, as this is the complete history, it did well enough to get so many sequels. So much so that even the average non-gamer Joe would be able to recognize the name. And who knows, they probably even played it. But let's be honest, the same can't be said for Virtua Cop. In other words, no matter what game you prefer, you can't deny it. You Suzuki, well... I think you've lost the battle this time, mate. House of the Dead 2 was created one year later on the far more impressive Naomi hardware. And yet again, one year after that, for the Dreamcast. This is the one that I have personally spent the most amount of time with. And oh my god, almost 20 years later after its release, it still feels bloody awesome. Everything looks a lot better, which I suppose can actually work against the game's horror vibe, I suppose. Your mileage may vary on that. But no matter how realistic they attempted to make the game, that all gets thrown out of the window when you hear that beautifully cheesy voice acting. Harry. Thank God you arrived. What the hell's going on in this city? Don't know. 
but it's very similar to the 1998 Tyrion case. That case? James, go and prevent the confusion in the city. Okay, let's meet at the Sunset Parade. Wait, counting on you, Gary. Leave it to me. For me, looking back, the first game is a tad too arcade hard. You know, it's still great fun, but when that Dreamcast was finally on its way, most games were actually made in a way for them to not only be easily ported to the system, as they both share similar hardware, but obviously, from the get-go, this game needed to work in the homes and the arcades. Which... It definitely does. In my opinion, it's a far more rounded gameplay experience, all whilst pushing the genre forward. The first game is mostly based around one house, and this second game is actually more focused on running around a zombie-filled Venice. This obviously opens up the play area as to which enemies can attack you, and for me, even though I've completed this game numerous times, it still feels so much more frantic than the first. Constantly keeping on your toes, and although it's probably a little bit easier, it's definitely the more welcomed experience for newcomers. Don't start with number one, start with number two on the biggest CRT you can find. That is, if you can't find the original arcade units. And don't be fooled by the 99p PC version, it's just not worth it. Actually, there are a few other ways to play this game too. I suppose you could get House of the Dead free, as number two is an unlockable game on that disc. Or if you want to play it on modern TVs, then there's the Wii version that had both number two and three combined. And well, I suppose with that, we've actually transitioned quite nicely into the House of the Dead free, right? Nope. Because, ladies and gentlemen, there was one final game in the House of the Dead franchise that sadly was the final game ever released in this series for Sega's very own consoles. <laughs> The Typing of the Dead. <laughs> yes, I know it's common knowledge by this point, guys. But damn, I love that this game exists. What better way to finally get some use out of your dusty Dreamcast controllers, am I right? Well, here's something I definitely didn't know before starting this historic script. The Typing of the Dead actually started in the arcades back in 1999. Yep, this is the arcade unit. And talk about unique. So for those that don't know, this game is essentially this game. But instead of using a gun, you use a keyboard. It turns what is already a fairly humorous game into a hilarious one. There's really not much else to say, except that the game did bloody well considering what it actually is, and it too also gained a fair few spin-offs. There's obvious sequels, which we will get to eventually, but The Typing of the Dead did also get a Japanese exclusive update called The Typing of the Dead 2003 for the PC, which got another Japanese-only update called The Typing of the Dead 2004, which got another Japanese-only update called The Typing of the Dead Typing Lariat. And, uh, well, what makes these games different than the versions before them? Um, besides a few tweaks and the addition of extra language sets, nothing. Obviously, the later they are, the better they are, but obviously, like I said, they are completely Japanese exclusive. However, if you do want to try them out yourselves, demos of each release can actually still be found as of the Halloween of 2018 on the Japanese official House of the Dead website. And if you think that's the weirdest this video is going to get, you ain't got no idea. Because, crazily enough, this wasn't the last we heard of obscure House of the Dead 2 spin-offs. Firstly, the original Typing of the Dead did in fact make its way over to the US, which is bloody awesome, although sadly not in Europe, and it got probably its very best release, although that will be argued by many, on the PlayStation 2, which actually came with a lovely official black Sega keyboard called The Typing of the Dead Zombie Panic, which even includes a few mini-games in between all of the action. 
Want more crazy? How about English of the Dead for the Nintendo DS, which actually got you to literally write down each letter with a stylus pen on your Nintendo DS? Not crazy enough? How about Zombie Utsu Flick of the Dead, which is another Typing of the Dead game for iOS? <laughs> you seriously can't make this stuff up. It's insane. Well, it's not over yet, folks, as two separate Java games actually came out in the House of the Dead series as well. One of them being in a top-down game, which actually doesn't look too bad, all things considered. And then there's Pinball of the Dead, which found its way into Game Boy Advance owners' hands and features scenes from both the first and the second game. Here's some footage of the game being played, and... Um, it's fine, don't expect amazing quality spin-off content that you got with the Metroid Prime pinball spin-off, but if you are a fan and want to experience three House of the Dead tables loosely based on some of the stuff that you've played in those previous two games, then <laughs> I really don't know who's asking for this. Then, well, if that person is you, then, you know, this is obviously for you. It's ridiculous that it exists, but I'm sure you are all the same as me. If you are still watching this, I am just so happy that it does indeed exist. The Pimble of the Dead. Just saying it makes me happy. And playing it? Yeah, it's a pretty good game. Stupid, but a pretty good game. And you know what's even crazier? These are still not the dumbest entries in the series. Oh no. The best is yet to come. You have to wait till the end of the video to find that one out. But before all of that, let's calm it all down with the third proper main entry into the series, simply titled The House of the Dead 3. We lost contact with Rogan. We can't wait any longer. I promised Mom that I'd bring him home. Let's go, Gene. By this point in the life of the series, Sega had sadly moved on to working on the competition's consoles. It was a tough time for us Sega fans, but for Sega, it was the perfect opportunity for them to show off what they were capable of as a third-party studio. During these confusing times, it was still sort of important for new systems to get the obvious gun game, and what better way to show that off than to create the third game in the mainline series on Sega's Chihiro Arcade hardware, which, if you didn't know, was actually based on Microsoft's first console, the Xbox, sort of like the Dreamcast and the Naomi Arcade hardware. Creating the third game like this simply meant easy porting. Now, there really isn't too much documentation regarding the development of this game. However, easily the most interesting piece was the fact that at one point early on in the game's development, the game was actually going to end up being cell shaded Although I am happy this never happened, I have got to admit, I would have liked to at least see what this would have looked like. You know, for curiosity's sake. Anyway, what's the game like? Well, it's House of the Dead again, and, and as I already said, it includes the unlockable number two. And yeah, it's House of the Dead again. There are a few notable differences, mainly the fact that the game has differencing paths that you choose at the beginning rather than in the game, which changes up what you see along the way. But probably the most interesting of all is the Mad Cat's controller. This time you reload automatically on the fly rather than shooting off the screen like you did in the previous games, but this was all flipped back to normal on the Wii version, which you can yet again reload the old fashioned way by shooting off the screen. But, play House of the Dead 3 in the arcade, then you will actually need to cock back the gun to reload it. 
It's a nice addition if you ask me. And yes, House of the Dead 3 did in fact mean that Typing of the Dead 2 was a thing. You don't want to shoot them? Then thankfully you can yet again kill them with great spelling, grammar and the ability to not look down whilst you're typing. Something that I have a hard time doing, which is why I never play those games. <laughs> So number 3 came as a two part set with number 2 on the Wii, but we also got a decent port to the PlayStation 3 which can be used with the PlayStation Move 2, making the whole thing far more accessible. Plus that version along with the Wii and PC ports actually have the added time attack mode which obviously sounds rather simple, but it's basically the best way to play the game. I can't suggest this enough, it's brilliant. So, moving on. New Sega Arcade hardware means a new House of the Dead game. This time, the fourth entry was made on the Lindbergh hardware. In short, this hardware was originally designed so that games could easily be ported to the 360, but this never went ahead because it was simply cheaper to use standard PC hardware to make that hardware, which in turn made it easier to port games to the PlayStation 3 due to both systems having similar GPUs. Again, it was a simple case of easy porting. Anyway, enough of the hardware jargon, let's just look at House of the Dead 4. Hell yes, it's time to take the series into true HD. Although that does depend on what version of the arcade you play, regardless, it looks stunning. As you would expect, the whole thing has become far more frantic as the players pick up mini Uzi submachine guns, which you need to shake frantically if you want to reload this time or progress in certain sections of the game. You also get grenades, which pushes the extreme even more. And just like the last game, you choose your paths as well as making minor detours at the beginning of each section. By this point, you know exactly what to expect. It's the fourth proper House of the Dead game, and when speaking to people recently over at the Play Expo event, which had the original House of the Dead, I was actually surprised to hear that this is the game that people remember playing the most. Perhaps that's due to accessibility. Regardless, for those that haven't played it, well, it's simply a great progression for the series that you are going to want to try. Now, sadly, there is another House of the Dead 4 game, well, actually a sort of spin-off thing, that I have not had the chance to play myself, and that is House of the Dead 4 Special, and I have been on a mission to play this game ever since its release several years ago. <sighs> So in this one, you actually sit with a friend if you fancy in this revolving seat as it spins at certain points of the game between two 100-inch screens. The game is essentially a few chapters tacked onto the end of number four, and even though I have sadly never played this awesome sounding special arcade, you can play these levels on the PlayStation 3 with the Move controller. If you ever, ever, ever see this machine, play it and document it, because by all accounts there are very few left in the wild due to constant technical issues. And this makes me very sad, especially considering this was the final arcade release for quite some time.
Right, before getting into one of my absolute favourites in the series, let's jump forward a few years and look at House of the Dead EX, or Living Dolls as it was also known, which is probably the most unknown classic arcade release going. This one is a huge step from everything else before it, not only in the game's art style and storyline, which in case you was interested involves you playing two zombies which have fallen in love and are actually trying to escape captivity, but also in the gameplay arena too. I mean, yeah, sure, it's still a gun game, but it's not what we have seen before. Probably the best way to explain it is if you mix House of the Dead with Point Blank, you get this. <laughs> I know, how awesome does that sound? You basically need to work together to beat minigames which only end when your zombie hand reaches the heart. After that, that zombie then pushes the heart towards his or her loved one to help them out until both hands are connected. Not only do you have a gun, but you also have a pedal, which is used differently throughout the game. Perhaps it's to squash spiders or simply just used to duck out of the way. This is easily... Sega's best kept secret in regards to sort of newer arcade games, and one that I truly am glad to say has only ever left Japan very briefly in Europe, although I've never seen it, even though you can easily change the language into English via the game's BIOS. Damn, it's such a shame that this one was never released, especially considering both transformed games pay homage to this series, which obviously we'll get to in a little bit. It just boggles the mind if you ask me. Ah, oh, anyway, enough of this, it's just getting me down. Let's move back to the consoles. It was called The Grindhouse. Theaters that played back-to-back -back movies featuring uncensored sexuality and hardcore thrills. Now, Tarantino and Rodriguez are bringing The Grindhouse back with two explosive feature films. One of my favourite movie experiences came out the very next year, Grindhouse. God damn, I love those two movies, created by two of my very favourite directors, which not only gave most people a great movie experience, but also gave a little bit of a warped history lesson into old cinematic experiences in dodgy neighbourhoods. I gotta admit, I was hooked on this concept, and I even ran a few public domain movie nights myself. So you can imagine my absolute delight when Hedgedrong's producer, Neil McEwen, was also a big fan and he decided to not do the generic or actually steampunk style as they had originally planned, but instead turn the often unintentionally cheesy and comical release of the House of the Dead series into a love letter to the most outrageous rape revenge, the blaxploitation, slasher, biker, zombie sexploitation, kung fu and women in prison movies of the 70s and 80s. <laughs> Those are his words, by the way, not mine. When there is no more room in Bayou City, the dead will walk the earth. As terror is unleashed, and mayhem cast in dark shadow. A string of disappearances and a hunt for a lost father bring together two unlikely adversaries and a stripper. Isaac Washington, a playboy cop sworn to uncover the shocking truth. A secret agent on his first deadly assignment. They call him only G. You ever going to tell anyone what that fucking G stands for? No. Forming a savage threesome to unmask the truth behind Papa Caesar's disgusting human experiments. Send the dead back to their graves. Rescue those in need. And save these hapless hit town folk from themselves. The House of the Dead. Overkill. Overloaded with terror, horror, flesh, ice cream, and raw, uncensored violence. Reload the hardcore you've been waiting for. A cop with an attitude putting the hot in shotgun. A 
mysterious agent who will make them suffer. Hello? And a stripper with two deadly weapons. They came for brains. You give them bullets. The House of the Dead Overkill. In stores from February 2009. No motherfucking way, man. I manicured only yesterday. Sega obviously loved the idea because of the marketing possibilities and Headstrong couldn't be happier with making it. Although, they did also want to make a new Jet Set Radio at some point too. So, you know, I'll let you guys decide if they made the right choice there. Regardless, House of the Dead Overkill was, for me, the perfect way to breathe new life into a series that was getting close to stale. Oh my god, this game is fantastic. Seven levels of pure carnage based upon obvious classic horror settings each time that are made to look like their own movies. I seriously, seriously love this game. I just can't get enough. It's perfect. It may be poking fun a little at a series that was never intended to be comical, and to be fair, it may miss the mark a few times, becoming more cringy than comical. But honestly, guys, grab yourself a few slope beers and a couple of Wiimotes, and you've got yourself a great night with this game. And hey, if you want more, you can even get the PS3 version with improved graphics and two extra levels. Or there's House of the Dead Overkill the Lost Reels for mobile phones or tablets. But you're going to have a hard time finding that one because the game has been removed and it's believed it was due to really, really bad reviews. <laughs> Oh yeah, there's also a uh, Typing of the Dead Overkill too, but by this point I really don't need to explain that one. Go get this on Steam if you fancy boosting your keyboard skills. Right, there is still one game in the series that I want to talk about, but before we get into the brand new 2018 House of the Dead game, there are a few other bits that I do want to mention. Firstly, the movies. <laughs> I don't care what anybody says. I actually like the first movie. It fits into the so bad it's good category and seriously people love to rag on this movie. It's even voted 41st in the worst 100 movies of all time and it has an average rating of 3%. <laughs> But all of this makes me just love the movie even more. However, that may be because I seriously want to go to a remote island to an exclusive Sega rave. <laughs> Can you imagine? Just, you know, if that ever does happen, then, uh, you know, don't turn me into a zombie, please. And also, don't make me watch the second movie. It sadly lost a lot of its charm for me. And it's really, really hard to finish. A sci-fi channel movie pushed out onto DVD is not only bad, you know, like the first one, sure, but this time it's really, really boring. There was also a third movie, by the way, that not many people know about. However, the House of the Dead branding, for whatever reason, never got attached to it. And some point during its production, it got changed to the awful name Dead and Deader. This, too, was a movie that was heavily panned. Another movie was in talks to be made by the company Circle of Confusion, but no news has come up since late 2016. However, there is one very good movie, a seriously good House of the Dead movie, and that's Wreck-It Ralph. Yeah, I know I'm digging the bottom of the barrel for this one, guys, but hey, you know what? There really isn't a lot to grab down there. Plus, I never thought I would say the sentence that a House of the Dead character is in a Disney movie. What a time to be alive. There is also the web comics of the House of the Dead, as well as a few proper House of the Dead spin-off comics that are rising up the eBay ranks, even though they are, you know, okay at best. And there is even the often unheard House of the Dead manga too. Honestly, I haven't looked into this one, but by all accounts, it's actually pretty good. There are also a few House of the Dead cameos in the All-Star series, starting all the way back on the iToy with Sega Superstars before going over to Sega Superstar Tennis, with one of the courts being based outside the mansion, and again in all of the All-Star racing games, and also in Project X Zone. But best of all is the new Sega game, Project Judge, which has a huge House of the Dead reference thrown in. God damn, I cannot wait for that game. 
I'm sure there's a few more, but these are the most notable. And right now, I just want to get on with moving on to that final game. This is the House of the Dead Scarlet Dawn. And just look at it. At this point, that's all we can do, as it's extremely new and Japanese exclusives. But damn, it looks fantastic. So much more frantic than anything before it. A gun that lets you choose from six different weapons, online nationwide leaderboards. And from what I can tell, this is just perfect. Easily the most exciting thing to hit arcades in the longest time. And something that I am truly excited for as I pray for its international release. Possibly on VR. Oh, come on, Sega. Don't let us down. After all, you put ooh -la, la on that thing. Why not this game too? And there you have it, guys. House of the Dead, the complete history. A crazy amount of games and spin-offs that literally never ever failed to impress me. It's a simple idea that Sega have always been able to pull off. Maybe that's because of its comedic nature of some of those spin-offs, but hey, I don't care. I welcome another 10 generic releases in the series with a few extra Typing of the Dead games thrown in for good measure. You seriously can't go wrong with the House of the Dead franchise. <laughs> Oh yeah, there is that crazy one other game I wanted to mention earlier, wasn't there? Again, I've never played this one, guys, but it's easily the most brilliantly stupid spin-off of any game series ever made. And that is, of course, this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's Darts of the Dead. And in this game, your job is to hit the right score to kill the zombie. Oh, come on, guys. This doesn't need explaining. What the hell, Sega? I bloody love you, you absolute nutters. Hey there guys, thanks for checking out the video. I want to give a big special shout out to all of my Patreons. But first I want to give a big extra, big extra, big shout out to that retro video gamer, Ryan Burford, Gary Pinkett, Andrew Dalton, Amon Namora, Tomic Grabowski, Christopher Turnbull, Brent Craft, Ben Jackson, Ian A. Chapman, Phil Lowlands, Tim Labonte, Mike Fallon, Retro to Next Gen, Quang DX, Tim Lund, Genovi, Hernanaz, Pixels Not Limited, aka Samuel Victor, Red the Beard, Conrad Constantine, Pretendo 64, Creamy Elephant, James Loveridge, Casey Garner, Blitz, Edgy Bengals, Savage Gaming Show, Brian Rawson, Gemma at Mr. T's shirts, Matt DX Prog Hackman, Solux Captor, Jeremy Rodriguez, Nick Pollard, Bram Perez, Garrett Leger, Marcus Kingy, Mocut Tindall, June Rob Jenkins, The Geeky Dad, Richard Carter, aka Fantastic Dizzy, Todd Paul Floachy, and of course, Petty Mew. If you want to get your name shouted out, get your name shown, come and see what I'm working on, join the exclusive rooms in the Discord chat, and all of the other stuff that all of these Patrons get to experience that you guys don't, then please click the link that you see on the screen. Don't forget to subscribe, give the video a thumbs up, a thumbs down, whatever you prefer. But for now, this is DJ Slope signing out, and hopefully I'll see you all next time.